So our first speaker this morning is Dr. James Heilman. Um, and Dr. Heilman is going to talk about uh, Wikipedia in medicine. So since beginning to edit Wikipedia more than a decade ago, uh, Dr. Heilman's become not just one of the site's most prolific medical contributors, um, but he, he not just edits content, but he coordinates translation, he does research, and he's encouraging others to contribute, uh, including all of you guys. A few years ago, he moved to working half-time as an emergency physician in Cranbrook, uh, BC, to make time for all these volunteer efforts. Wikipedia doesn't pay him for all this. And he currently sits on the board of trustees of the Wikipedia, Wikimedia Foundation, which is the not-for-profit which hosts the site. So I give you Dr. Hallman. Great. Thank you. So, a little bit about myself. As mentioned, I'm a small-town emergency room physician. I'm affiliated with UBC, but I'm a long way away. Um, just over a decade ago, uh, I was working a night shift in the emergency department. I was looking at, uh, around the internet, and I came across this website that wasn't very good. Um, then I noticed an edit button. I hit that edit button, and I realized that I could fix the internet. And um, I've been madly trying to fix the internet ever since. So first question is, does the internet matter? Um, if one looks at where people get health care uh, information, the average American visits their doctor about three times a day. If we're generous, we say the average physician appointment is 20 minutes. The average person is spending about an hour a year seeing a physician. But they're spending 52 hours a year uh, looking online for health care information. So if we want to make sure people have access to high quality health care information, we need to make sure that the internet is um, accurate. Are you switching that? Um, so, you know, want me to use this one here? So it's, it's, it's captured right now. Okay. Just keep going. Okay, so, um, uh, and, you know, if you look at other countries, other countries' physician appointments last even shorter. So, you know, in Bangladesh, the average person, when they see a physician, they have 48 minutes for that visit. Oh, there we go. So, quick question for the crowd. Who here has used Wikipedia? Basically everyone. Who here has edited Wikipedia? Much smaller group. Hopefully we can change that. So is Wikipedia read by nearly everyone? The answer is it's getting there. So Wikipedia is the fifth most popular website in the world, the first four being Google, YouTube, Facebook, and Baidu. Uh, we get about half a billion visits per month. People come by about 1.5 billion devices, and they look at about 16 billion pages of content. When it comes to medicine itself, this is some data from back from 2013. In 2013, even though medical topics only made up half a percent of all of Wikipedia's articles, they represented 3% of Wikipedia's page views. People care a great deal about healthcare um, uh, online. And people looked at about 7 billion uh, healthcare-related articles on Wikipedia, uh, and there's about 160,000 of, of uh, healthcare articles in about 300 languages. Um, Here's a comparison of the readership of Wikipedia versus the readership. Uh, here's a comparison of the readership of Wikipedia's medical content versus the readership of other prominent uh, healthcare resources. And back in 2014, it looked like Wikipedia was the single most read healthcare uh, website online, which probably makes it one of the foremost healthcare resources in the world. Medical stats, so who's using Wikipedia? Somewhere between half and 100% of physicians are using Wikipedia in, in surveys, both in the developed and the developing world, 35 to 70% of pharmacists, about 94% of um, medical students, and we know it's frequently used by journalists and policymakers as we occasionally catch them copying word for word from Wikipedia. Um, <clears throat> This was an interesting study that looks a little bit more into detail with respect to why medical students are turning to Wikipedia. Uh, and, and these were medical students at a, a first world university. They had access to you know, some of the best medical resources via their library, yet they were still turning to Wikipedia. And they asked them why, and the, the two big answers were, one, Wikipedia is written in language that's generally understandable. And two, Wikipedia is easy to access. You know, you go to many websites, you have to punch in passwords, you have to go through multiple hoops just to figure out that wasn't really what you're looking for anyway. Does Wikipedia cover nearly everything? And um, it's starting to get there. Uh, there's still work to do. If, if one was to print out uh, English Wikipedia um, uh, in textbooks the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica, it would take the equivalent of 127 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica to hold the uh, Wikipedia's medical content. Does Wikipedia have a huge number of um, editors? The answer to this is sort of yes and sort of no. Um, as you're probably aware, 
anyone can edit Wikipedia, but not everyone does. There are about 80,000 people who make more than five edits a month, about 12,000 people who make more than 100 edits a month, and these are generally all volunteers and working for free, and they've sort of formed these self-governing communities uh, through which to collaborate. Now, with respect to medical editors, this is a much, much smaller community. Um, there, you know, this, back in 2017, there was about 320 Edit, medical editors who made more than 250 edits to Wikipedia's medical content. These numbers have been more or less steady between 2008 and 2014. And half of these editors are working in English, so there's only really about 100, the core community is only about 150 uh, people working on English Wikipedia, and there's about 150 individuals working in the other 300 languages in which we have medical content. And who are they? We surveyed our, our core community a number of years back um, to ask them a little bit about their background. Uh, the answer was, was that about half of them are healthcare providers. About half of them have a master's, PhD, or MD. An additional third have uh, a bachelor's degree. 80% uh, describe themselves as male, 10% describe themselves as female, and 10% either uh, uh, counted themselves as other or would rather not say. Um, why we have this male predominance, we're not quite sure, uh, but it's definitely something we would um, like to change. So with respect to a question I often get from academia, is Wikipedia reliable? And the answer to this is also sort of yes and sort of no. Um, first of all, when it comes to reliability, it depends on how you define reliable, and it depends on what you compare Wikipedia to. Uh, I always tell my students and residents that there is no perfect source. Our goal at Wikipedia, rather than truth, is verifiability. Our hope is that you know, if we summarize the best available resources, the best available evidence, we will end up with one of the best available sources. Uh, comparisons of Wikipedia to Britannica, of course that other uh, famous encyclopedia, found that Wikipedia was about as accurate as Britannica both in 2005 and uh, 2012. Uh, additionally, Wikipedia has a bunch of internal peer review processes, and there's lots of automated tools that help uh, assure the accuracy of Wikipedia. This is a little bit small, but um, you know, some of the older Emerge docs might remember this, this book. This was produced by the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians um, over a decade ago. Incredibly useful, uh, but it contains some significant errors. You know, um, if you look down on the right lower page there, you'll, say, you'll see that it's saying you know, the, the dose of midazolam for procedural sedation is one to two milligrams per kilo. Um, uh, so you know, we're talking 70 kilogram person, 70 to 140 milligrams of midazolam for procedural sedation. Now you of course can see, you know, my copy, I've taken my pen, and I've scribbled out the, uh, the incorrect information and, and adjusted it. But you know, if someone was to follow this book blindly, you would kill people. Um, so, and how are we doing with respect to referencing Wikipedia? Here's a look at the number of references supporting Wikipedia's medical content over time. And currently, there are over 2 billion sources supporting Wikipedia's, or 2 million sources supporting Wikipedia's medical content. And when you look at the subsection of sources supporting Wikipedia's medical content that comes from journals, uh, what we see is we see that the most, you know, the most respected journals within medicine are also the most frequently used uh, sources of medical information by Wikipedia. Um, Co the Cochrane Collaboration is uh, actually the most used uh, a journal within Wikipedia. Additionally, a couple of years, about a year, year and a half ago, uh, a group of us took a bunch of medical students and we decided to you know, run a study on them. And what we did is we took 120 Canadian medical students in their first and second year. Um, we gave them a, a, a Canadian licensing-like exam of 25 questions. They had the chance to write this exam. And we then took these students and we randomized them into three groups. One group of students got access to Wikipedia, one group of students got access to uh, Up to Date, and one group of students got access to Harrison's Textbook of Internal Medicine. The students then had 30 minutes to spend with their assigned resource. And then they had the opportunity to uh, take notes and then rewrite the first exam, uh, the same exam that they initially wrote. And what we're looking at is we're looking at you know, which one of these resources may you know, help students do better on a Canadian licensing-like exam, i.e., which one of these resources made medical students know more of what we think um, in Canada that medical students should know. And um, uh, the, the result was that Wikipedia and Up to Date were basically equivalent. Uh, There's a trend toward Wikipedia being more useful than, than up to date. Uh, and both of these resources were better than um, Harrison's textbook of internal medicine. And you know, probably some of the reasons was people could find the information more quickly on Wikipedia. And uh, Wikipedia had the linking that made stuff easier to find. 
<clears throat> Here's another interesting look at um, um, you know, other websites are turning to Wikipedia. So, so both Facebook and YouTube this year have turned to Wikipedia to help solve some of their issues around reliability and, and the fake news uh, issues that have been um, spreading through the media. Next, what I'm going to speak about, I'm going to speak about some of the projects I've been uh, working on to try to get Wikipedia out to a larger number of people. Uh, the first one is the Medical Translation Project. So basically, this began back in 2012. What we're doing is we're, we're working to write short overviews of medical topics, so three to four paragraph overviews, about 750 words. These overviews are then becoming the lead or the beginning of the English um, uh, medical articles. We're making sure that we reference every sentence. We've written uh, just over 1,000 of these over the last five years, working with a bunch of medical uh, schools on this, including some here in Canada uh, and um, uh, UCSF down in the United States. And then what we're doing is we're working with our partners, Translators Without Borders, Wikimedia Taiwan, Rubric, et cetera, to get these um, short summaries translated into as many other languages as possible. Uh, we're working in about 100 languages, and we have uh, translated about 5 million words of text over the last few years. This is an example of one of the articles. Text is a little bit small, but what you see, you know, four paragraphs of content touches on all the key aspects of uh, the disease in question. So the second step is translating this content into other languages. Um, we're using all human translation, no machine translation. Uh, if you look at machine translation, Google Translate, for example, only claims to work in 70 languages, and we're working in uh, substantially more than that. Uh, and the exciting thing is, you know, we're seeing that some of the local languages have improved the content further in their language. So, for example, um, you know, the HIV AIDS article was translated from English into Persian. Uh, and then the Persian community wrote specific sections on HIV AIDS in Iran, very important for a Persian language encyclopedia, less important for an English language one. We've had some amazing language champions. Uh, this is here the retired orthopedic surgeon from uh, East India. He speaks the language Oriya, otherwise known as Odia. There's about 40 million people who speak this language. They have a small Wikipedia, um, and he himself has translated 800 of these articles into his language. And the amazing thing is if you take the, the, you know, the title of the articles that he has created and you pop them into Google, before he wrote this content, there was nothing on the internet in his language. You know, we take for granted that you can take any term, you can put that term into Google, you'll end up with one or two million hits. That's not the reality for many, many languages out there. So this one individual is creating some of the first content in his language, um, um, and his language is spoken by, by tens of millions of people. Additionally, there's no machine translation that works in the language of Oriya. One of our successes um, pertained to Ebola, of course, back in 2014, a uh, big outbreak in, in Africa. Uh, we worked to improve this content in English, get this content into more than 115 different languages, and um, this content ended up getting about 100 million page views in 2014. Uh, the interesting thing is, you know, I was at a conference speaking about this issue a few years back. I met this gentleman from Microsoft. We at Wikipedia collect very little information about who's using our site, but Microsoft collects everything about everyone. Uh, and, we, and I asked him, I'm like, you know, is this content really getting to those who need it most? You know, of course, people in the United States, people in Canada, you know, they might be curious about Ebola, but for those this material really matters, these are the people who are in the countries that are affected. And a couple days later, he sent me the results, and he said, it does appear that Wikipedia was the single most used um, um, website in each of the four most affected countries, with the CNN coming in second, CDC coming in third, and World Health Organization coming in uh, fourth. Then the next effort we've been working on is how do we get this content out to those, you know, to, to those who are far away in, um, um, you know, digitally non-connected areas. So, you know, if you look at the world globally, 3.9 billion people are not online. Many of them because they either can't pay for it or simply because there's a lack of infrastructure in the country they're in. Um, you know, even I went to Philippines. My wife and I went to Philippines uh, about a year and a half ago. And, and you know, I paid for internet access. Uh, I popped open my phone. And with so many people on this limited infrastructure, I just simply couldn't access the internet much of the time. You know, it would work for about an hour a day. And then with everybody trying to use the internet, things would fall apart. But there's a silver lining. 
Cell phones are widespread. Six out of seven people globally have a cell phone. So we're working on a number of solutions. One is working on apps that you can download to your phone. So when you do have internet access, you download the content, and then when you don't have internet access, everything is living on your phone. And then the second thing is I'm working on offline distribution systems that you can send out to the middle of nowhere by, by post, and um, you know, or people can carry them there, and then they'll have access to everything on Wikipedia, but in an offline environment. So this is the first solution. This is you know, the offline app. It's a partial offline solution. Uh, we built it back in 2015 with um, a group called Kiwix out of Switzerland. Uh, they were the programmers. And the app basically contains all of Wikipedia's disease, anatomy, sanitation, uh, dentistry, and, and medication-related content. It's a big app. It's 1.2 gigabytes, so it takes up a fair bit of space in your phone. If you want the version with the video, it's even bigger. We have a little mini version um, that we have trimmed the pictures and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and what we have found is this, this app has been getting to those who need it most. 75% of the downloads are from the global south. We've seen almost half a million uh, downloads of the app for Android. Um, we've seen more than 40,000 downloads of the app in Arabic, for example. Uh, we have versions available in 10 languages, and then there's a few tricks you can get versions of the app in, in, in even additional languages. For those who use um, Apple devices, uh, we recently launched a, an iOS version of the app as well, and if you type in wiki space uh, med, you'll be able to find this app both on the um, Android Play Store plus on the um, Apple Store. And then the other solution we're looking at is something called Internet in the Box. And this is a fully offline solution. I have a little, uh, you see one of the devices there sitting on a, a $20 Canadian bill. And what this is, this is basically a little microcomputer. Uh, it lives inside that box. You plug it in to a power supply. It generates a Wi-Fi signal. Up to 30 people can then log on to the device via its Wi-Fi and access everything that exists within this little box. Um, it does not connect people to the internet generally, it just connects people to the content that is pre-installed. And you can power it either by plugging it into the wall, you can power it by a battery, you can power it by a solar panel. Um, <clears throat> we're shipping these all over the world. Um, you know, we've shipped them to places like the Dominican Republic and Guatemala, um, uh, Puerto Rico, as Puerto Rico is, is struggling with getting access to the internet again. Um, you know, they're hoping that they can elect a president that, that realizes that he is actually their president, and that will improve things. Um, and these devices are built up of various modules. So, uh, you know, the module we see on this version here, it has the medical uh, module in English, the medical module in Spanish, um, we have other open content on the device as well. We're shipping these devices for the cost that you know, the cost of the underlying material. So they cost somewhere between 30 to 60 uh, US dollars to build, uh, depending on what size of USD card you're using. We've found some people to uh, manufacture and distribute these in other countries as well, um, specifically India, and we're working to get someone distributing them in Nigeria as well. If people are technically inclined, there's also instruction on how you can build their, your own. Uh, all the components are available off the shelf. <clears throat> we, um, we're about to launch a trial of these devices in Nigeria. Uh, we're hoping, to, you, know, you know, we have, um, we have a, uh, some funding from the Africa Center plus from the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, we've hired a project manager. This will hopefully be starting soon. Uh, we're going to be distributing 360 devices within Nigeria and then collecting data on, on what sort of impact this has on the ability of physicians in Nigeria to provide health care. Uh, this, is, this is what the device looks like. Uh, so this is the new version. This is a 128 gigabyte version. It has all of English Wikipedia on it. Um, in all of English Wikipedia, if you want to download Wikipedia and put it on your phone, it takes 77 gigabytes. Uh, but we have English Wikipedia on that little device. And basically, you know, the situation is you can take the largest encyclopedia in the world and you can put it on a device that fits easily in the palms of your hand. So, can you guys edit? Yes, definitely. Um, if people want to try out the device, uh, I have one sitting up here. If, you, everybody, if people pull out their, their Wi-Fi enabled device, you can log on to it with your computer. If you, uh, for the first 30 of you, if, if, if you go to your Wi-Fi, you'll see um, um, uh, a Wi-Fi signal called Internet in a Box. There's no password on it. You just simply connect to that Wi-Fi signal. And um, your device will probably tell you that you're not connected to the Internet. That's perfectly fine, because you're not fully connected to the Internet. You're only connected to this device here. And then you can open up whichever browser you like. Um, um, you know, be it Chrome, be it Firefox, be, be it uh, Safari, and you type that URL 
HTTP colon front slash front slash box dot lam into your browser, and that will then take you to the home page um, uh, of the of the device. So let me, I got a couple minutes here. Let me see if I can um, um, show you what it looks like. So we'll exit this, and then I go down here. And then oh, I'm not seeing it listed. Maybe it decided to turn itself off. Oh no, there it is. Okay, so internet in a box. And I'm connected. And then I need to um, grab myself a browser. So that one there. I go up to the browser line, then go HTTP, um, T colon box.lan. And you know, it's not, it's not the fastest computer inside that little box. Uh, you know, this is based on a, on a bit of technology called a Raspberry Pi um, 0W. Um, it has about half a gigabyte of RAM, so not as fast as what you know we're used to in the developing world, but uh, but generally, um, uh, did I spell it right? Might take some fiddling. Okay, perfect. Well, Brian, I think I'll uh, I'll finish there. Great.